Welcome to Proof of Concept. In this video, our goal is to examine how a mathematician formalizes arithmetic modulo n and prove that it works. All that's required for this video is familiarity with modular arithmetic in practice, which is the topic of our last video, and some familiarity with the concept of mathematical proof. See the links in the comments. In our last video, I drew this picture for you of the integers wrapped around the mod n clock. Each green circled ray in this picture is a collection of integers which drop down to the same notch on the clock. In this example, 1, 6, 11, 16, etc. are all 1 modulo 5. We also saw that you can do arithmetic modulo n by doing it in the integers, but moving freely along the rays whenever needed. So that if you want to compute 8 cubed mod 5, you may as well compute 3 cubed instead, because 8 and 3 drop to the same notch on the clock. If you haven't thought about modular arithmetic this way in the past, then please review the Modular Arithmetic User's Manual video, link in the description below. I'll depend on this picture for the rest of this video. To capture this idea, mathematicians think of numbers in the same ray as equivalent, or we might say congruent, for the purposes of modular arithmetic. In a way, all the integers in one ray are just a myriad of different names for the same notch on the clock. We could say 8 mod 5 or 3 mod 5 and we would mean the same thing. By the way, this is an example of an equivalence relation, which may be helpful terminology if you've studied relations. Otherwise, just think of it as a special type of equivalence. Now, our goal is to build modular arithmetic formally. For that, we will want to do three things. We will want to define the elements or numbers we are using, define their operations, addition and multiplication, and prove that the operations are well-defined. The term well-defined means that the definitions we've given don't have any internal contradictions. We'll get to what this means in due time. Goal 1 will take a little while. We could start by saying modulo n, our numbers, are just the set 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on up to n minus 1, the notches on the clock. But that'll make our life more difficult in the later two parts. In fact, what makes the later parts easier is if we can use what we already have, the regular integers. If we can define modular arithmetic by reference to usual integer arithmetic, we'll be halfway to proving the things we want because we have so much previous structure to draw on. So instead of thinking of the numbers as the notches on the clock, let's think of them as the rays on the clock. For that, we need to group the integers into these rays, and for that, we need to formalize this notion of equivalence that I've referred to above. Here's the definition. Let n be an integer. Let a and b be integers. Then a is equivalent, or sometimes one says congruent, to b modulo n, which we write a triple line b brackets mod n, if n divides the difference a minus b. Note that the vertical bar here is the verb divides. Okay, as always, upon meeting a new definition, let's test it. 8 and 3 are equivalent modulo 5 because 5 divides 8 minus 3. Okay, looks sound. In other words, this definition tells us that we can generate an entire ray of this picture by counting out in fives. Here are the rays mod 5. For example, 3 and 18 are in the same ray because their difference is 15, which is divisible by 5. To be even more concrete, look at how the ray containing 7 can be generated from 7 by counting up and down by 5s. Okay, great. Now we can define the rays as objects in their own right. Definition. Let n be an integer. Let a be an integer. Then the equivalence or congruence class of a modulo n is the set, which we denote with these square brackets right here, the set of b in the integers, such that a and b are equivalent mod n. Here I'm setting the square bracket notation as a shorthand for the whole ray, or the collection of integers. I've used set builder notation to describe the ray as a collection of integers which are congruent to the element a. For example, the equivalence class of 1 modulo 5 is an infinite collection that has this pattern minus 4, 1, 6, 11, 16, and so on in both directions. Another name for the same equivalence class is the equivalence class of 6, modulo 5, or the equivalence class of minus 4, modulo 5. Any of the elements of the equivalence class can be used as its name because they all define the same ray. A side note, when you're studying equivalence relations, you'll prove rigorously what seems apparent here, which is that the distinct equivalence classes are disjoint. 
i.e. the rays don't cross each other at any integers. Okay, for practice, stop the video now and compute the equivalence class of 3 modulo 8. Here's my answer. Okay, finally, we can also give a name to the whole collection of equivalence classes. Definition. The integers modulo n, denoted z mod nz, is the set of equivalence classes modulo n. For example, z mod 4z has four elements, the equivalence class is represented by 0, 1, 2, and 3. This is because the 4 clock has four arms. Every integer falls into one and only one of these classes because every integer has a remainder of either 0, 1, 2, or 3 when divided by 4. Of course, we don't usually bother writing this so formally, and we just use the congruence notation we're used to, without any square brackets and all that jazz. But for this video, we're being very careful to be formal. Now, I just asserted that mod 4 we get these four equivalence classes and nothing else. Of course, in general, that needs proof. Theorem. There are exactly n elements in z mod nz, namely the equivalence classes 0, 1, and so on, up through n minus 1. Let us give a proof. We'll just give a short proof here, which depends on something called the division algorithm. First, None of 0, 1 up through n minus 1 are equivalent, like equivalent to each other, mod n, since they're too close to one another to have a difference divisible by n. So these equivalence classes are distinct. Second, we'll show that every integer falls into one of these classes, which implies that there are no other equivalence classes. This is simply because there are no integers left over, if they all fall into the classes we have already. Now we use a familiar fact. Any k in the integers can be expressed as k equals ln plus r, where l is an integer and r is an integer in the range from 0 to n minus 1. This fact is known as the division algorithm, and it's a topic for another video, um, in fact, but it's very familiar to you, so we'll use it here without further discussion. It's simply the statement that when you divide k by n, you have a remainder somewhere in the range between 0 and n minus 1. But if k can be written that way, then k and r are separated by a multiple of n. So that means k is in the equivalence class of r. With this we've shown these equivalence classes are distinct and there are no others and so we have a total of n elements and we're done. Okay, we've created the elements, we're done with part one. Now let's move to part two, defining the operations. Definition. Let n be an integer, given two equivalence classes, a and b modulo n. We define their sum, a plus b, to be the equivalence class of a plus b, and their product, a times b, to be the equivalence class of their product, a times b. Okay, note that the colon equals means that we are defining the left-hand side as being the right-hand side. So the right-hand side is something we're familiar with, and the left-hand side is a new thing that we're defining. So before having this definition, equivalence classes were just things with no operations, and so writing them with a plus sign in between didn't mean anything. Now it does. This definition gives us a procedure to compute a sum or product of equivalence classes. That is, we pick something from the equivalence classes and add or multiply that in the original integers, and then take the resulting equivalence class. As an example, let's work modulo 3. Then the equivalence class of 2 plus the equivalence class of 3 is the equivalence class containing 2 plus 3, which is 5. We're more used to writing this fact as 2 plus 3 is congruent to 5 modulo 3. Similarly, the equivalence class of 2 times the equivalence class of 3 is the equivalence class of 6. See how we leverage the fact that we have addition and multiplication in the integers to give addition and multiplication modulo n. But wait, 2 has another name modulo 3, 5. This is just another name for the same thing, but it highlights that this definition has a potential problem. If I write 2 as 5, the definition gives me quite different instructions for addition. 5 equivalence class plus the equivalence class of 3 is the equivalence class of 8. I've shown in green to the right here the original facts for comparison. In other words, addition may not be well defined unless both ways of doing this computation result in the same answer. In the last video, the user's manual, we gave two ways of doing a modular arithmetic computation using this ambiguity, but they both got the same answer. Here we got 5 one time and 8 another time. This seems like a problem with our definition, if it can give different answers. But wait, these are the same. 
because 5 is 8 mod 3, so the equivalence class of 5 is the same thing as the equivalence class of 8. Actually, this equivalence class is more usually written as 2. Pause the video for a moment and check that multiplication did the right thing also. Okay, so it looks like it works, but my point is that there's something to check here, something to prove, that this defi definition is well-defined. The term well-defined is a mathematicianism that can apply when a definition gives a procedure to compute an answer. If there are any ambiguities in the procedure so that two people who come along may compute it in totally different ways, then either it's well-defined, all ways to compute give the same answer, or it's not well-defined, different ways give different answers. If your definition is not well-defined, you'll have to throw it out. So now we'll prove that this definition is well-defined. That's actually part three of our th three-step plan for the day. Theorem. Let n be an integer. Let a, a prime, b, b prime be integers. Suppose that a is congruent to a prime mod n, and b is congruent to b prime mod n. Then a plus b is congruent to a prime plus b prime mod n, and a times b is congruent to a prime times b prime mod n. In other words, this theorem tells us that when performing an operation modulo n, if we change out the name of one of our equivalence classes, we still get the same answer as an equivalence class. You might like to pause the video here and back up to compare to the example on the last slide. This theorem is exactly the statement that the definition is well defined. Now let us prove this. This is an example of a proof where the way you discover it doesn't match up to the way you write it. So I'll show you, show you my margin chicken scratch. We have two hypotheses here, that A is congruent to A prime and B is congruent to B prime. Recalling the definition we used for congruence, this means N divides the difference between A and A prime and N divides the difference between B and B prime. We can also write down our goal, let's focus on the addition fact for now, in terms of div divisibility. That is, n divides the difference between a plus b and a prime plus b prime. So we want to relate these two things. So let's try to see a minus a prime and b minus b prime in the goal. Uh, there it is, if we rearrange a little. Okay, so now let's write down a formal proof. By hypothesis, n divides a minus a prime and n divides b minus b prime. Therefore, n divides their sum. Rearranging, n divides the difference between a plus b and a prime plus b prime. Hence, these two are congruent. That's addition. I'll leave multiplication as an exercise. Now, you might be wondering, what happened to subtraction? And for that matter, to division? Well, it turns out that we've already done the heavy lifting, because we can just define subtraction via the difference between equivalence class of A and equivalence class of B being defined as the equivalence class of A plus negative one equivalence class times the equivalence class of B. So as an exercise, you can try and write this as a formal definition, but since it depends on addition and multiplication of equivalence classes, there's no issue about being, it being well-defined. As for division, that's a very, very interesting question and the topic of a future video. I'll just leave you with some food for thought on that one. So first, we can't depend upon division in the integers because, at least if we want to stay in the integers, we can't divide 1 by 2 in the integers. But at the same time, notice that 3 times 2 is 1 mod 5. So 3 at least kind of acts like a half in the sense that when we double it, we get 1. I'll leave you with that mystery for now. Okay, so now we've accomplished step three. In fact, we've accomplished our three goals for today. We've formally defined the elements of Z mod NZ as equivalence classes under the no notion of congruence modulo N. We've formally defined addition and multiplication on these equivalence classes, and we've proven that they are well-defined operations. Let's tie things up with some final thoughts and reflections. First, you might be wondering whether these operations, addition, multiplication, and subtraction, besides being well-defined, are well-behaved in other ways. That's a really great question to chew on. So for example, in the integers, we expect certain kinds of behaviors, like that when we add things, the order doesn't matter. A plus B should be B plus A. So I'll leave you with a challenge. Can you gather a list of good behaviors for these operations? Can you prove that they also hold for the operations in the world of modular arithmetic? And last, let me say a few words about context. We are familiar with the integers, our counting numbers, 
and with the real numbers, which we use to measure distances in our physical universe, for example. But mathematically speaking, a number system is just some stuff, the numbers, together with some operations, like addition and multiplication, that behave in a familiar way. So by stretching our minds a little, there are actually many other number systems that behave a lot like the ones we're already familiar with. The foremost of these include the complex numbers and modular arithmetic. Both of these play fundamental roles in understanding the physics of the universe around us and the mathematics of our lives. You might wonder, where does modular arithmetic appear? It certainly appears in physics, because understanding the symmetries of the universe involves understanding a wide variety of number systems. A simple example is the rotation of an object. If the object is a pentagon, say, then it has essentially five notches of rotation. Systems of symmetries like this appear in particle physics, chemistry, geometry, they're absolutely everywhere. There's even a system of symmetries, much more complex than modular arithmetic, but containing some modular arithmetic, that describes the symmetries of a Rubik's cube. Another place modular arithmetic plays a role is in understanding the integers themselves. For example, we might wonder if the equation x squared plus y squared equals 40,003 has integer solutions. Solving polynomial equations for integer solutions is a big branch of mathematics with its own applications. In this case, in fact, it's not too hard to show that it doesn't. Here's how that argument goes. If x squared plus y squared equals 40,003 had an integer solution, then x squared plus y squared congruent to 3 mod 4 would have solutions too. We just take everything mod 4 and the relationship still has to hold. This is because we use the operations in the integers to define the operations mod n. But mod 4, it's easy to check that 0 squared and 2 squared are 0, and 1 squared and 3 squared are 1. So you can't add 2 squares to get 3. We've reduced a seemingly at least very large problem to a very small finite one by looking at it through our mod 4 goggles. This is a very powerful tool, and so modular arithmetic is used in proofs throughout mathematics. Finally, I'll mention one more place modular arithmetic plays a role, which is cryptography. Our modern digital cryptography, including how your connection to a website is secured in your browser, is all built upon the mathematics of modular arithmetic. In this case, the modulus is huge, hundreds of digits long. This will be a topic for future videos. That concludes our discussion of the how and why of modular arithmetic. Go forth and enjoy some mathematics.